Okay, we'll see. There are some, you know, practical hash functions out there. Uh, okay, now there's a, a kind of fundamental problem that comes up in lots of areas of cryptography, but it's particularly relevant here, so we'll mention it here. The so-called birthday problem. Before we get to the birthday problem, let's mention the pre-birthday problem. Okay. Now, let's suppose we have, uh, I mean, if you took a math class, I'm sure you saw the birthday problem, but, you know, uh, so somewhere in your life you've probably seen it, but, you know, here's your chance to see it done the right way. So. Okay, so anyway, suppose you have n people in a room, so the question here is, how large does n have to be before the probability that somebody has the same birthday as me, exactly the same birthday as me, is at least one half? Okay, and, and, and the way you'd say that is, you know, how big does n have to be before we expect to find somebody? That word expect just means probabilities, at least one half, okay? Okay, so how do we do this? Well, it looks like a probability problem, right? Discrete probability. How do you solve discrete probability problems? I wouldn't say you always do this, but lots of times. You look at the complement, right? You look at the complement and then you subtract that result from one. Okay, so let's do that. Let's say, uh, look at the complement means what? Okay, means nobody has the same birthday as me, right? So my birthday is one of the 365 days. So that means your birthday is not the same, could be any of the other 364. What's the probability of that? 364 over 365. So that's the probability you don't have the same birthday as me. And then you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't. All those are three, 364 of these. There's n people, right? So that's the probability that there's n people in the room and they all don't have the same birthday as me. So what's the probability at least one does have the same birthday as me? One it's one minus that, okay? And I want the probability to be at least a half, so I'll set that equal to, to a half and solve for n, okay? So uh, what do I find here? Well, in this case, I find n is 253. Does that seem right? No. Just intuitively? No? What do you think it should be? Much less. You're thinking of the normal birthday problem. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just intuitively, does this seem right? I'm asking for the same birthday as me, one person, right? And there's 365 different birthdays, so you might expect, you know, you need about 365 people before you expect to find one that has the same birthday. And it's about 365, so it seems to me it's about the right order of magnitude, okay? That's the way I would think about it. Okay, so nothing really tricky there. Now we're to the birthday problem. Okay, the real birthday problem. <coughs> And the question here is, how many people have to be in the room before we expect two or more, any two or more, to have the same birthday, all right? Now, how would we find this probability? Also by the complement. Also look at the complement, okay. No two people have the same birthday, okay. So my birthday is one of, can be, my birthday can be any of the 365, okay. Yours has to be different. So you only have 364 choices. Yours has to be different than both. Okay, because we're trying to find not, you know, a complement of this. So he's got 363, 362, 361, uh, so on and so forth, right? Okay. So, uh, again, that probability looks like this. Mine can be any of the 365, that's a probability of 1, his can be any of the 364, so on and so forth. Within people, that's the last term. Set, uh, subtract that from 1, you get the probability that at least two or, two or more people have the same birthday. Set it equal to a half, right, and solve for n. Same, same as before. And what do you find? You find n is equal to 23. Does that seem right? Okay, does that seem intuitively correct? <laughs> okay, the intuition here, what's going on? It seems too small, right? How can you just need 23 people and then you have two or more with the same birthday? How can that possibly be correct? So they sometimes call it the birthday paradox, right? It seems paradoxical when you first see it. Um, but I say it's not paradoxical, if you think about it in the right way. Uh, why? Why is this maybe the right number or right order of magnitude? What's different about this than the previous problem where I was comparing everyone to me? Any two. Any two, okay. So why does that make a difference? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, if I'm comparing everybody to me, everybody gets one comparison, right? We get like n comparisons for n people. If I'm comparing everybody to everybody else, how many comparisons do I get? N No, not quite n factorial. Mm -hmm. N choose two, right? I'm comparing every pair with everybody else. What's n choose two? That's about n squared. So we'll approximate that by n squared. So I get like n squared comparisons with n people, whereas before I only got n comparisons with n people, right? So n squared comparisons. Once the number of comparisons is about 365, because that's all the possibilities there are, once the number of comparisons gets to about 365, I would expect to find a match. That would be my intuition. Okay, so that says n should be about square root of 365, which is pretty close to 20. Okay, so that's the thinking. Okay, so we're comparing all pairs, and that's, that's the trick here. So you know, by comparing pairs, we get like roughly n squared comparisons. So the number that we should require is about the square root of n. So the weak collision is more like the pre birth the paradox, uh, and strong collision. Exactly. That's exactly the analogy we want to make here. Okay, so the weak collision resistance, so there is a connection here. Okay, I didn't just talk about this because I love birthdays so much. Uh, no, if we have the difference, the difference is that instead of having 365 days, if we have a hash function that produces an output output of n bits, then there's two to the n different possible outputs. Okay, with two to the n different possible outputs, how many hashes do I need before I expect to find how before that that weak collision resistance thing kicks in? Well, it's about two to the n minus one, right? Or two to the n roughly roughly on that order. But the strong collision resistance is the interesting one because in that case, if I can find two to the n over two different values, hash them, compare the results, I would expect to find a collision. Okay. So what this is really saying is sort of the, the easiest thing to attack on the hash functions is that strong collision resistance. That's sort of, the, in some sense, the strongest requirement. Because if I can just generate this many different randomly generated hash values, I would expect to find a collision. Okay. Now, if you think about this in terms of, you know, so, so in a sense, this is like the brute force attack on a hash function. Okay. What I'll do is I'll just generate random values, start hashing them until I find a collision. I know that after I hash about 2 to the n over 2 guys, I would expect to find a collision. And then the hash function's broken. Okay, because I found a collision. Okay, so if your hash function produces a 128-bit output, how much work is it to find a collision by the brute force, it's kind of exhaustive search approach? Two to the 64. Two to the 64. So if I can hash two to the 64 things, I win. I've broken your hash function. And on the other hand, if your hash function produces a 256-bit output, how many things do I need to hash? Two to the 128. Good luck with that. Okay, that's okay. To 64, that's that's tempting. That's, that's close. Okay. Okay, but anyway, if you compare this to a symmetric cipher, if you have a symmetric cipher that produces a key that's n bits, what's how much work is an exhaustive search? How many keys do you have to try? <laughs> you try about half of them, right? And you expect to find the correct one. So that's two to the n minus one. In comparison, if your hash function produces an n-bit output, 2 to the n over 2 is the amount of work you need to find a collision okay, and break the hash function. So what does that say? How big does your output of your hash function need to be compared to the number of bits in your symmetric key for the same level of security? Twice as big. It needs to be about twice as big. So if you're, if, if you're one of those people who insists on using a 256-bit AES key for everything you do, your hash function should be 512 bits. Good luck with that, okay? Okay, but people, you know, don't really think this through, and they often use hash functions with 128 bits or something like that, but then they insist on using really big symmetric keys. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay, so before we get to the uh, cryptographic hashes, I want to look at a, a few uh, examples of non-cryptographic hash hashes. That things like you might see when you talk about hashing in other contexts. Okay. 
Okay. So let's suppose our data here, we split it up into bytes, okay? So it's n uh, bytes, numbered 0, 10, minus 1. And here's what I'm going to define as my hash. I'm just going to treat those as numbers, okay, and add them up, all right? Well, okay, is this a cryptographic hash function? Well, okay, what properties should it satisfy? Is it efficient? Yes. Yeah, it's pretty efficient. Does it provide compression? Yes. It compresses. Okay, is it one way? I don't know. How about collision resistance? Does it have collision resistance? Okay, no, it's actually very easy to construct collisions here. Uh, for example, if you take these two bytes, can you find a collision? <coughs> Well, how about if I just reverse those bytes? <laughs> okay, addition is commutative. Okay, I can reverse those bytes, and I'll get exactly the same thing. Okay, so we just constructed a collision, so that hash function's broken. Okay, it's not going to work as a cryptographic hash function. Okay, but surprisingly, you can just soup this up just a little bit. Okay, instead of just adding up the bytes, let's Take the number of bytes and take the first guy times n, the next one times n minus 1, n minus 2, and so on, and add those guys up. Okay, now, is this guy a cryptographic hash? Well, it's still it's got the same problem. Okay, you can very easily construct collisions. It's not quite as easy as before, but you have to work a little harder. But you can still easily find collisions. But this, even though it's a pretty simple idea, is actually used in practice. Okay, it's used in this tool. Uh, called rsync. Has anybody ever used this? <coughs> rsync. What's it for? Syncing data over network. Yeah, so the idea is you might distribute these files out at the start of the day, right? And people work on them, and some of them change and some of them don't. So you don't want to go to all the effort to, you know, update the file if it hasn't changed, right? To copy back the new version if it hasn't changed. So this is the thing you use to check whether the file has changed. You compute this hash, and if it matches, you say, oh, that file hasn't changed. If it doesn't match, you say, okay, that file has changed, and you copy it back. Okay. So it's good at detecting changes to files. So why can't we use it as our cryptographic hash function? That's kind of what we want, right? We want to detect changes to files. You know, if the files are different, we should get different values. Is cryptographers just being annoying and they just want these really crazy hash functions that serve no purpose? It doesn't satisfy all the conditions required. Okay, then why do we need all those conditions? I mean, this sounds close to what we want to do, right? If you have someone purposely making changes in a specific way that matched up, so that you That's would exactly That's exactly right. Okay, now in this utility, you're just looking for sort of random changes in files, right? And you can detect those almost surely. But we're not, in cryptography, we're not dealing with random changes. We're dealing with an intelligent adversary. And if that intelligent adversary makes the correct, proper changes, we would not detect it. So we want something that even the smart, intelligent adversary cannot trick. Okay? So you're dealing with Trudy, not just random changes here. 